Now we are going to have our last panel discussion. The topic is transparency and visibility M2M plus IoT and the connecting devices, how it will change the face of supply chain and logistics part two. Intelligent analytics and making use of the big data part two. The subtopics, product development and commercialization, risk management, operational efficiency, improved fleet management. Thank you. Uh, so it's a little cold inside. I don't know India why we do this. When it's very hot outside, we try to bring the temperature down. We follow the Western world where it's cold outside. So keeping the temperature low is saving energy. Here we waste energy where we have to put on coat to be in a hot weather. But let's come back to this topic. Uh, personally, I've been involved with uh, many things which are around network embedded systems. And uh, the supply chain issue came up mainly because the production center and the consumption centers were separated out and needed to carry goods across. So one of the work that I did with wildlife was to actually, in some sense, a smart supply chain where we're tracking the wildlife. And as you know that long back, we used to use animals to supply things. Uh, one sentence on the TIFAC actually, TIFAC is a technology think tank and it's uh, the Department of Science and Technology. We had developed India's technology vision 2020 under Dr. Kalam's chairmanship. Probably we're still in the morning phase of uh, Dr. Kalam's death. But uh, now we are ready with technology vision 2035 document, which uh, we are hoping primes to launch sometime. Uh, this technology vision document is a draft version uh, waiting for Prime Minister's approval. Uh, it's there on our website, so you can access this document, you can give your feedback. This document is a vision document for the country. Uh, the difference between 2020 and 2035 is that 2020 focus on India, this is focusing on Indians. The difference between country versus citizens. This document is being followed with 12 technology roadmaps to achieve this vision. I'll not go into more, I just wanted to show you this so that you can go to our website and download the vision document, and look at it and uh, give your comments. Uh, it's a TIFAC, T-I-F-S-C dot O-R-G dot I-N. If you go back 2000 years of history, if you see of India, manufacturing India was doing wonderful till about 1750. So first AD onwards, if you look at the manufacturing sector, India and China were roughly between 20 to 30 percent of global manufacturing. From 1750, India's share started to drop. What happened at that time? Industrial evolution was taking place in Europe. Factory-based production started. In India, the supply chain system was set up actually to supply raw materials out of the country to Europe. The railway system was set up for this purpose. Just now Dr. Shashi Tharoor gave a very nice talk on this, where the railway was not to, for Indians, actually, it was to carry raw material out of the country to Europe, so it could be processed there, and the finished goods be supplied back. So this was kind of supply chain that was set up to do that. What I wanted to share with you that why we were producing a lot more earlier, because of the distributor manufacturing, with larger population, we could actually manufacture more. But when factory-based system came in, the production started to get centralized and the consumption was distributed. And that's where the supply chain management started to become important. Today, we are at a situation where, again, something else is happening. And Shilpi added, first she had M2M and then she added IoT. And I hope that in the next one or two years, we'll add 3D printing or additive manufacturing because now we are again go coming to a stage where distributed manufacturing is going to take place through a technology like 3D printing, where the production of the goods will start to happen closer to production consumption center, which means the whole supply chain logistics is going to change in the next 10 years probably. So people who are involved in this game have to look at this very carefully, where the complete supply chain logistics is going to change because of manufacturing technology undergoing a change where starting from centralized uh, production now, it is going to be distributed manufacturing. That is how we see the future uh, in next 10, it's already happening in a few sectors. 
For example, one sector I'll tell you right away where it's going to make a major impact is spare part supply. If I have automotive you know, vehicles, to supply the spare parts is a major task. I remember several years back, my old father's old car had a problem. We were in a small town. The fellow said that mechanic that, no, getting this spare part will take me seven, eight days. Let me go to lathe machine and build this part and fit it. So it took him two to three hours to do it. Same thing is going to happen where you don't need to actually get the spare parts from somewhere. You'll produce the spare parts at the place where you need it. Okay. So I just wanted to bring to your attention that we need to look at how something like a disruptive technology like 3D printing is coming on the horizon while we're still talking of IoT and M2M, something else is happening in the background and we, we must be aware of that. Personally, I would like to see that rural clusters of distributed manufacturing based on something like 3D printing where Prime Minister's digital initiative would likely to enable the broadband connectivity to the rural areas. Combine that with the postal services which will supply the raw material and take out the finished goods. This is the kind of system that I'm expecting to, to take place uh, where the 3D printers will combine with other things together to have a distributed and customized manufacturing. Uh, let me stop at this point, and what I will do is that we discuss in the, among the panelists. Uh, the way we'll proceed is that I'll introduce all of them in the first round itself. And then we'll give each of them two, three minutes to talk about it, and we'll make it more interactive. So we'll let you ask questions to the panels and then discuss. Because I can see that all of you are already tired, and <laughs> we want more interaction uh, rather than you know, one-way lecture kind of thing. So let me start introducing the panelists one by one. <clears throat> if I can find the introduction sheets, yeah. So I have Mr. C.P. Singh first. Uh, so he is from founder and CEO of Smart 24 by 7 Response Services Private Limited. I think supporting this activity right at the top. So without you, it would not have been possible. So Mr. Singh is an enthusiast and a task person. That means gets tasks done with a passion to perform and deliver ACLs. results. He was the co-founder of Group CTO to SITG, which is Smile Interactive Technology Group. His technical expertise stems out of years of experience with managing internet technology for some of the world's leading brands, such as Microsoft, Monster, etc., and so on. He has helped many startups. I'll not read out the name because it'll take away all the time. It's a long list. So Mr. Singh is a serial entrepreneur who successfully founded a new venture under the name of Smart Group, and it has, he has a number of companies within that, like Smart Automation and so on and so forth. So Mr. Singh, welcome to the panel. Then Mr. Krishnamurti Vaidyanathan. So, <clears throat> he is an engineer with an MBA degree from Indian Masters of Technology from IIT Kanpur and bachelor's degree from Birch Pilani and then Master of Science in Management degree from New York University Polytechnic. Right. Uh, he has conceptualized and managed EI Labs India since about last 10, 11 years. He has over 25 years of product development and research experience in the area of Consumer electronics with focus on digital communication, digital signal processing, and hardware software system architecture, and so on. He headed the Innovation Center for Digital Television at Philips Semiconductors prior to finding EI Labs. He has served as a research engineer in various management roles in Philips Research US and Defense R&D organization in India. Welcome to the panel. Then we have Commodore S.K. Sahani. He's president and CEO of Dolphin RFID Private Limited. Just now we were talking uh, before this thing, and he said that he can talk almost all the topics that we have listed here. But we hope that he'll focus on some things. So Commander Sahani is President CEO of Dolphin RFID Limited. He's a postgraduate electronic engineer and super specialist in the field of electromagnetics. He's a certified RFID engineer and an inventor with two major patents in his name in the field of M2M communication. Commander Sahani is a serial entrepreneur and an innovator by nature. During his 26 years in the Indian Navy, he was the founder director of Naval EMC Center. He's the senior member of IEEE USA as well as fellow of the Institute of Engineers India. Then we have Professor Vinay Maitri. He's professor of programming and head of Center for Analysis and Systems Studies, GIS and Remote Sensing at School of Planning and Architecture, the most famous schools in the country. Uh, he's 
He has had an experience of more than 35 years in the field of intelligence systems. And he joined the Department of Transport Planning in in 1982. He's done PhD in computer science from IIT Delhi after doing MSc from Delhi University. I also did my MSc from Delhi University, by the way. And right now I sit in IIT Delhi campus. <laughs> His fields of interest are in system science and design, software development, system testing. In fact, his lowest whole list of things, but I think main focus on transport, intelligent transport systems. He's handled about 50 projects uh, from various government agencies and PSUs. He's a member of a number of committees related to intelligent transport systems, smart city for different organizations. So welcome to this panel. So we are going to follow this that everybody speaks two to three minutes so people know that what kind of expertise they have and then we'll let it be open to question and answer. So I would request Mr. C.P. Singh, you please start with your part. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so my, my uh, expertise uh, or the topic of today uh, discussion is that uh, transparency in the whole system. So. Uh, we have worked in the safety security zone and the transport management system uh, and uh, what we have found is that uh, transparency uh, uh, that we have brought into the system so something like uh, we have extended our platform to the police city police so uh, whenever there is a citizen who is in the panic mode uh, he presses the button and immediately the city control room comes to know of it uh, they know the name of the person the phone number of the person and the location of the person, and then they dispatch the PCR towards it. Uh, so uh, in the city of Chandigarh, we have deployed uh, uh, smart tablets in all the PCRs, uh, and there is a computer ready dispatch, so which means that uh, the nearest PCR will also get the alert apart from the city police station also. Uh, so this is a level of transparency that we have brought in uh, that the victim gets connected to the end uh, uh, the responder within 15 seconds of the, of the press of the panic button. So uh, there's a lot of transparency we have brought in. Uh, the issue uh, that crops up is that uh, now this, all the senior officers knows that my PCR is responding in X number of minutes basically. So the SLA can be defined. So it has pros and the cons also. So sometimes there is an over transparency which says that, okay, the SLA was for 20 minutes, but the, the police reached in 30 minutes kind of thing. So why, why that is happening kind of thing. So this is what we have done in the safety security side of it. At the other point, as I mentioned in my presentation that there are a lot of misses which used to happen in the uh, transport of the employees basically. So the driver used to lie that uh, about his location, about uh, how much time it is going to take. So now uh, every employee uh, has a smartphone app uh, which we have provided. They know exactly where the, uh, where the cab is and how much time it is going to take to reach uh, the cab to reach to them basically. So uh, with this transparency brought into the, uh, the entire ecosystem of the uh, logistics of the employee, uh, the vendors are happy about it, the, the supervisors who are managing the cabs are happy about it and at the same point of time basically the transport manager, uh, he has further extended his dashboard to the business SBU uh, users basically. Uh, so uh, they don't need to reply the mails that when is my uh, XYZ employee going to reach office. So they have given this dashboard to the, to the SBU head itself and they can see uh, when their employees are going to turn up for the shift basically. So in this way, it has, uh, the, 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 the platform that we have built has brought in a lot of transparency across the board and is helping the people to become more uh, efficient. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we come from a background of uh, enabling uh, more efficient fleet management, which is I think one of the points that we are talking about uh, in today's panel discussion, uh, where we outfit in the aftermarket scenario uh, a vehicle, a truck, it could be it could be a car or a van with GPS and other accessories to it, uh, in order to give visibility to where the commodity is, in terms of the geospatial location, in terms of its context, and also in terms of what it is carrying. Uh, I'll give you an example. We've done some uh, reasonably interesting project with the public distribution system in Tamil Nadu, 
where uh, from the FCI godowns you have uh, charted routes through which the material has to be carried to the PDS outlets. So, uh, as one of the speakers had pointed out earlier, it created a geospatial layer of all the uh, uh, PDS uh, outlets for the first time. They, even the uh, PDS Corporation of Tamil Nadu was not aware of exactly where the uh, final retail outlets were in the state in certain districts. Uh, because we actually sent people on motorbikes, the roads were not proper, we got it, uh, you know, um, uh, geolocated bay using some Garmin devices, brought it onto a map, and then when the uh, vehicle leaves a particular uh, FCI godown, the uh, officer there actually uses a handled machine and uh, generates the trip sheet of that with the uh, material that has been loaded into it. It could be rice, wheat, how many tons of it, in which route it is going. So when the route chart is there, so you know this is supposed to be offloaded at say one, two, three uh, PDS outlets. Each of the PDS outlets were geofenced. So what happens is that the truck when it approaches it, automatically in Chennai, they are able to figure out that this particular vehicle has visited all these PDS. First proof of visit is important. Second, how long it was there. And then, from the PDS outlet, on their handled machine, when they receive the material, whatever that is um, sort of tallied with what has been offloaded from here. There was also one social experiment that was done for a short while. I don't know what is the status of that. They used to send an SMS to a few prominent uh, uh, citizens of that particular, uh, around that particular PDS to say that this commodity has come. So that it becomes like a vigilant group which can check whether really that has come. All this effort was being done in order to cut down the leakages in the system. So the entire M2M uh, technology that was deployed was used to one improve the efficiency of the delivery system and cut down the uh, leakages. I'll give you one simple example. On Thursday evening, we uh, dispatched uh, about 75 brochures of us uh, addressed to Shilpi here, care of Rohan Arora, uh, Radisson Blue Hotel by Blue Dot. It was supposed to have come Friday evening. Saturday morning, we called them up, material not delivered. They said it is out on delivery. This is at 9.15 in the morning. At 3.30 in the afternoon, they say it's still out on delivery. They can't say when it will be delivered. We called him again at 4.30 saying it's going to be 4.30, you please deliver it. Again, it is out on delivery. At 6.38, they are saying that material was not delivered because the person was not available. Then again, <laughs> they tried on Saturday. Same story, six calls from Bangalore and finally at 5.35 material is delivered. But beyond saying that the material is out on delivery, there is no further visibility on that. You think about the situation of this being a more mission critical material being uh, delivered and this with a premier uh, uh, courier service like Blue Dot. Okay. So, the penetration of M2M, what I'm trying to get to is, the penetration of M2M is still not very high. Even though the technologies exist. Most of the experiments are being done in the government sector. And that is something that needs to be also thought through. So, if we have to necessarily bring a smarter supply chain, First of all, the capabilities of the system should be clearly understood and the benefits should be quantified. I am not aware of any real research paper either from the academic or from the industry which says that this technology will save X amount of money. Because unless that is there, industry adoption, I do not know how that is going to happen. Private players who are actually creating the technology, 
may not have the wherewithals to generate such data as well. So, with those opening remarks, I just hand over. Uh, maybe we can. Yeah, just, just one comment before thing. One of the tasks that CII and TIFEC is trying to do to exactly respond to this, that what kind of technology the particular industries adopt based on the cost-benefit analysis, and they're requesting us to partner in this activity so that a company industry can approach us that, you know, we want to adopt a new technology and what is the relevant cost-benefit so they can choose the right one. That's the task we are in the process. I'll request Commander Sahni to give his initial comments. Thank you. Uh, my comments are not going to be in line with what all you have been hearing today. Uh, I, uh, as, as a CEO of a company which decided a, a year back that this country is not yet ready for IoT. This country is not yet ready for smart chain logistics. I say this with all humility because to be ready for this, you need to be ready to understand and accept total visibility. We do not want to accept total visibility because we like to hide our weaknesses instead of letting them be seen. Let me give you a couple of examples. Girish spoke of a couple of things, trip performance and load planning. We can do a lot of trip performance and load planning if the big data which is available to us is used. Do we want to use that big data? No, we don't want to. Let's, let's take it. A, how do I do my, load, uh, my, uh, my trip performance? I have a new truck. This truck should actually give me unfettered good service for say 10,000 kilometers. I don't need servicing for the first 10,000 kilometers. I do all my performance planning based upon this data. What happens? In the second trip, the driver changes the tire from a new tire to a slightly old tire. No one is aware of it. The third trip, the tire fails. All my trip performance goes for a six. Why this happens? No, again, rightly said, technology exists. Enough papers exist. All of us know what we need to do. But are we prepared for the visibility? I, I, I say here very, with all humility again, we are not. A year back, my company is eight years old. We are one of the very few players in the world who are focused purely on RFID. And RFID, ladies and gentlemen, is the first ground block of giving you IoT. Until you can identify items, identify so-called things, individually with a UID, you cannot go forward and build onto anything further like IoT. Uh, we decided that maybe India is not yet ready, so let's go abroad. So last year we just went abroad. And I can give you an example here. In Tanzania today, we are running with a logistics company which has 1,200 trucks. All we did with them to make, to improve their trip performance was we said on each one of your tires, tires incidentally in, uh, as a transport is the, the largest segment largest cost item for running a transport. So all we said is let us put RFID tags on each one of your tires. So all the trucks, whether they had six tires or 10, put an RFID tag on it. There is, there is, we put one RFID tag on the windshield and we put four more RFID tags, one on his GPS system, one on his battery, one on the alternator, and there was one more, uh, I forget where we, we did that. So they had in all either, either 6 plus 4 or 10 plus 4 tags on each one. All the company did was very simple. Every time the truck came into its uh, original place, one gentleman with a handle reader now what he does is he goes to the windshield, touches the tag, on his screen falls down, what are the tags now he needs to be checking in the, in the truck. He just with the same handle he walks around goes under the truck and all the tags typically are read from four to six feet away. So he's able to read all the tags on the tires behind and everywhere else. And literally in two minutes, he knows that his vehicle is 
with the original components which is started. Okay. And the, the, the beauty is that the first two months, they found batteries changed, they found alternators changed, they found tires changed, they found tires turned around from front to back without anyone telling them. They found tires being run on low pressure, which, which in any case reduces the, the life of the tire and thus reduces the performance of a, of a transportation. All these things, ladies and gentlemen, I want to put to you, exist in our country today. And until we are prepared to go to that visibility levels, that we can, uh, we, can, uh, we, we can then start saying, okay, now I can plan to have a smart supply chain. I give you another example, FCI. Someone spoke in the morning about FCI and about the silos and about, uh, about the grain, about 30% of grain which is lost every year. We did a study with FCI two years back. We started with a Monday, we loaded the truck there, when we loaded the truck, we put a tag on the truck windshield and the, the way bridge, the data from the way bridge was linked to the tag that when it came to an FCI go down, as, as it reached the gate, the tag was read, the information of, of the truck came up, what load it should be, what, what, what it should not be, where in which silo the item should go, all this came out on the screen. We went up to a very high level director security level in FCI. Everyone is gungo, we need to do it. When it went to the minister, he says, are you fools? Why do, why do I want this visibility? I don't want this visibility. And if I don't want this visibility, I cannot go anywhere. Okay. So I can give you umpteen number of examples, but having said that, uh, I think the, the future is bright. We have some of the best technological brains and I, I, I can, two of them are on each side of me. They are, they are entrepreneurs, they have built up beautiful systems, they definitely have a, have a future. All I can say is, all of us, whatever we can do, we should push the government for more visibility. Thank you. Thank you. So, Professor Vinamathri, in your initial comments. Uh, sir, I think that uh, I will let a little bit uh, speak more on the initial comments because, uh, uh, first of all, I am sorry that I have not attended uh, this program from the morning, I joined late. and uh, but. After uh, going through the, this uh, last uh, four lectures, uh, four uh, presentations, I am very much uh, convinced that uh, technology part is well taken care of that and uh, information part is also well taken care of that and uh, small portion of transport is being touched which I have listened by from Mr. Girish. Yes, I am very happy that uh, in the whole supply chain management system, if you uh, do research deeply into that, you can manage your store, you can manage your production line, you can manage your delivery system very well. But the two more components that is the transportation system and information utilization systems. These are the two key factors which can have a very big impact on the profit of the whole systems. And uh, in a transport system, I like to introduce one more word that is transportation planning for which we are preparing the engineers to serve our country and this is a, such a uh, discipline that adds multi-dimension to the smart supply chain systems. I will give you a very few examples the practically which were applied. Uh, for example, fleet size optimizations. We have done for a number of uh, factories and companies in northern India. What should be the appropriate fleet combination which optimize their delivery systems? Is it a LCV sh should be selected or SCV is selected or bigger truck is to be selected for particular type of delivery of uh, material and also the destination where they are going to go. But probably, for example, you are going to deliver a material where right away is not more than 10 meter or 50 meter and there you are sending a big truck and the whole day will be spent only to taking your material and downloading it. You are having the road condition, you are having the complete knowledge of that, so you can optimize it. And we have done it at least one dozen companies in Punjab and Haryana for their supply chain management. Not only that, uh, route optimizations. This is another science in transportation planning we are taking. 
some component of uh, OR sciences, some component of statistical technique, we are coming up with the softwares, which will give us the what is the best alternative routes. And not only that uh, alternative route, if we are uh, in India, we are going to uh, use the ITS technology for traffic management and all the traffic centers are giving the road condition and traffic condition live to the control rooms. And if the logistic companies are being provided that type of feedback, then you are the best judge and the software can provide you which route is suitable for this uh, particular delivery mechanisms. And it saves money, it saves time. And uh, we have tested one model. For example, for delivery system and supply chain management system, if you are trying for the static data, then what is the value of time or how much time we are going to save it in delivery systems? And if we are taking a variable time, okay, we deliver it, whatsoever our products are ready, and we will serve it. That we have also tested. And we have also tested that if you are having uh, in route information in advance, how much time we are saving it? And the fourth one is we have developed a predictive models that on the basis of time series data, if for a particular company, if we have developed that model, then we have proved millions of dollars can be saved within a year for that company. This is a proof. The best is given by the predictive model output. The second best is given by if you are getting online in route information of the road condition, traffic conditions and other conditions, then our profit is much more. And this model we have created for working for the whole month data for all the peak hours, non-peak hours and that's. Uh, simulation which I have created. And uh, one project we have done it for inland water transport systems. There's the concept of mobile inventory. Few smart companies, they use inland water transport or other slow transport system to provide a mechanism of mobile inventory that uh, all the inventory is available on the uh, shipment and nor the uh, producer or not that uh, the receiver is uh, paying for that. And uh, similarly, number of companies, they are using black box technique in their machines. I have come to know and I have seen that one of the big uh, uh, vehicle manufacturer company, they have put up the black box into the engines and they are monitoring without telling to the user the performance of their vehicles. And on that basis, they are estimating that in southern part of India, this part of components will be uh, demanded more or this part of component will be demanded more and accordingly they are keeping their warehouse updated in different part of our country so that there will be a minimum downtime. That is the best thing. Not only that in foreign countries that uh, black box is giving a very good uh, input to the insurance company by seeing the driver behavior and by the company behavior they are fixing up the insurances of the transshipment as well as the vehicle they said that uh, always your vehicle is over speeding and you are doing this this this, this block so your insurance clause will be changed so and uh, the last point is like to say that uh, the correct delivery point how to ensure that goods are being uh, shipped at an exact point and exact place. These type of techniques we have also seen that it is working. And finally, it is the information utilizations. If I know that my a particular type of product which is produced in uh, Himachal Pradesh and going up to Chennai, how many forms I require to clear it, what type of uh, licenses and what type of paperwork and everything I require it in time and where is what type of uh, uh, traffic regulations are there. So you can design the whole journey accordingly. If you are not using it then the, it is a loss on that system. So by these two remarks I will say thank you. Just one couple of comments. Uh, one was in, I was in Minnesota for a couple of weeks and 
One thing they told me there that the Federal Express, what they did, they designed their route so that they could actually, the trucks always turn right. They never took, in the US right turn is free, uh, opposite to us. So always, even if they take longer route, it will always turn right and that's how they fix. So they could save a lot of fuel, costing millions of dollars because they didn't have to wait at the you know, stop signal. Of course, in India it will not work because <laughs> it is blocked. It is always blocked with the right or left. Well, the second thing, is, one suggestion I had for you actually, the other thing they had done was, in situation of emergency, when you evacuate an area, how do you guide the transport so that the minimum time is lost in doing this? Uh, if you're already working on it, it's okay. Sir, uh, in both that, uh, the right uh, turning is already being used uh, in a daily system, one of the US companies, very well. And they are showing that because the right turning movements are there, so they're dropping and picking up time. And up, uh, if you just make a calculation over the whole delivery system, and they concluded a period of time, it gives the best things and optimizes the total cost. So there's a different route uh, uh, optimization techniques are available. And secondly, sir, the sensors and data equation systems are available in the market that, uh, for example, uh, the vehicle conditions and there is a leakage. It will immediately intimate. And not only that, the traffic management system, which I am associated with a uh, number of traffic police of the uh, different states in my country, we have developed area traffic control system, which is online giving, feeding the data after every half a minute to the control rooms and immediately message will be flashed and accordingly the uh, red light and green light and variable message sign combination will divert the whole traffic that there is a blockage and there is some emergency don't take that route and message will be flashed on your FM radio and if you are hooked up or you book yourself on the traffic police side so SMS will also come don't use that route. So these things are available. Yeah, the, other, the one that I was talking about, the emergencies, major emergency happens, a gas leak, for example, or so something. The then, uh, how if your uh, vehicle is connected with that uh, sensor, if the gas is leaking it, the vehicle condition is le leaking it, and that is connected with your company's company server, and company server just push up the message to that traffic control room or emergency response, quick response teams. So then they can manage the whole traffic and the whole area. Disaster management uh, uh, as a institute, they have make up a plan. If it is a type this category of disaster, that category B, they are a type of disaster, what to do? Their blue book is ready. So if this thing happened, what to do and to whom they have to contact? The only thing is uh, your sensors and your communication device uh, should work properly. Sure. That's it. So let's uh, open the panel for discussion. So we want more interaction, please. Any questions? So one of the crucial data which is required for analytics is basically held by government. Whether it is the traffic control or whether it is the, uh, uh, in anything, uh, whether it is uh, uh, designing a new product or new policy, anything. most of the data is basically controlled by government. When do we really have uh, the industry to really participate and make real use of that data because the real beneficiary of that data would be uh, intermediaries who could really convert that data into uh, monetize that data for some meaningful purpose for which people are ready to pay but that has to be provided as a service and when it has to be provided by so as a service Government can never really kind of get into it to really make it uh, uh, meaningful, this thing, because there's too many bottlenecks there. So intermediaries are required uh, everywhere in the world. That's the way that uh, monetization of uh, uh, public data is really done. Uh, so anybody the, uh, wants to comment This thing on I'd that? like to really kind of have, especially from TIFAC and uh, uh, some of the other panelists, uh, maybe from Mr. Vinay as to what, what one could really do uh, to develop a framework around uh, the big data analytics. So one, one thing we are doing in traffic, uh, we are involved in national mission of electric mobility. So there now we are setting standards where certain data in certain format would be shared, both the, infra the charging infrastructure and the vehicle data. Of course, we have not looked at how it's going to be analyzed. 
but that's one part that, that we are working on. And uh, I will let the other panelists. You know. yeah. So <coughs> from a, uh, I think the best example is Google. So you are, all of you are able to see the traffic data on your mobile phones, which has been crowdsourced by all the, all the people. Uh, all of us are contributing to it and we are getting the services from it. And Google is monetizing it also. So what you wanted to say. Uh, from a safety security perspective, what we have implemented is that wherever people are feeling unsafe, so they press a button called I am unsafe. So this data is now getting stored on our server and we, we, are, we, we would like that this, uh, uh, this platform get utilized by most of the Indian citizens. And then the outcome of this is that when you are going through a, a particular street and if it is uh, most of the people have felt unsafe over there, we will be able to inform you that this is an unsafe place. Please, do, please be careful about that. And secondly, uh, uh, the same thing we are using for the crowdsourcing is the traffic data. Because sometimes uh, in the early hours or basically there, uh, there's a roadblock which the driver sees. So he will be having a button on his uh, smart device to say that there is a roadblock ahead. Hence, the rest of the vehicles who are coming at the back basically will know that there is a roadblock and hence they will be able to take a detour. So all those things, we are building those kind of technologies and basically uh, in the time to come, uh, these, uh, these services will be made available to the rest of the Indian citizens and uh, we, we will be coming out with APIs so that anyone can consume these uh, services. No, I would like to give you an example that Delhi is the first city in India which implemented area traffic control system in 2000. Unfortunately, uh, now it is not working, but other states are much ahead of Delhi, Mumbai, Bangalore, Pune, Nasik, which they are implementing and working perfectly. In this, uh, in Delhi, which have done the experiment, up to 42 intersections uh, covering from uh, a ridge area and going up to Bhairo Mark, and the whole NDCA area, which is the sensors are being installed on the roadsides. And real time data is coming to the traffic center. And algorithm is there, school technology is there, which optimize the maximum traffic flow. We are having the vehicle identifications. That is buses, trucks, and cars, and motorcycles, etc. And finding out that on which particular route, which particular direction, the maximum traffic should get a benefit accordingly, the signals red light and uh, green lights are being adjusted online within five minutes the whole signals are being adjusted on the whole route not only that if some vip some fire brigade and some ambulance is going on the complete green signal can be provided to them so that was experimented and was working very well worldwide and that data is available on the servers but unfortunately daily now Nobody has taken care of that afterwards and it is not working but other places working very well and shows that uh, it's a lot of fuel saving, lot of travel time saving to the all passengers and it, uh, uh, in economical benefits the whole cost come out within two months. Whatsoever investment is being done it for that particular 50 intersection up to 100 sections, the whole cost you can recover it economically in forms of value of time. Thank you all of you for your participation to the discussion. Now, uh, I would like to ask Mr. Pro Professor Prabhat Ranjan to hand over these mementos to the panelists. Now I would like to request uh, Mr. Sushil Kumar to please come on stage and hand over the memento to Professor Prabhat Ranjan. <laughs> 